Hi, I'm Adriana Zumbo. In this video today, I'm going to show you how to make shoe pastry. The cake I'm going to make today is lemon and maple religious, which is two profiteroles stacked on top of each other and filled with a lemon and maple cream. Uh, I like to make this because it's uh, a bit challenging and it's a delicious thing to eat. So the first thing I'm going to do in this dish is I'm going to make the sable. So the sable will sit on top of the shoe pastry once I, I make that after this and be created like a crackle effect. So to, to start that, it's very simple. It's pretty much uh, equal amounts butter, flour and uh, raw sugar. And to make the job easier, I'm just going to use the mixer which, uh, with, the, with the beater attached. So just put it all in. So the mixer is just going to help us mix it a lot more evenly and a lot faster with a lot less mess. So just on a low speed, I'm just going to start mixing that, bring it together and then just slowly increase the speed. So I don't want to over mix this too much either, so I'm just going to bring it, just bring it together and stop it. Take the beater out. Just clean any uh, dough off the beater. And then I'm just going to scrape it onto the glad wrap. And just flatten it down. Just make it into a small thin block so it's easy to roll. The thicker you make it, the harder it'll be to roll. So always when you do pastry or any sable, you keep it really flat so that when you do need to roll it, it's uh, less work. So just a nice thin parcel like that. So I've just uh, wrapped that up nicely and I'm just going to pop that in the fridge just uh, to, to firm up for uh, about an hour or so, uh, just so it's easy to roll out. So next we're going to make the shoe pastry. So to start that, um, I've just got in a, in a saucepan, I've got the milk, water and butter. And I'm just going to switch on the induction. And I'm just going to put it on a medium heat, say like six, just to bring that up gently. We don't want to put it on too, too fiercely because we lose a lot, of the, a lot of the water and a lot of the liquid will evaporate in the whole process. So uh, that's the beauty of induction, is uh, the control you have over your saucepan and over the heat. Also another advantage of the induction is the quicker boiling times, so you're not standing around for too long, you know, there's a lot more power generated through the bottom of the induction um, and it's a lot more energy efficient. Now my water, butter and milk has come to the boil. I'm just going to add my flour. So I'm just going to add it in one go and then stir quite vigorously just to bring it all together. You can see the paste starts thickening up. So what we're doing is cooking out the gluten. So this is called, our, this is called a panay. Just want to keep stirring it for about 30 seconds to a minute. If we want to cook the gluten out in the flour, give us the strength in the shoe in the oven, otherwise what will happen is they'll probably collapse. They won't be nice and airy inside. You can see how it's come away from the sides of the pan. It's, uh, that's what we want to look for as well. So I'll take that off now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw this mixture into the, into the mixing bowl. Just tip it all in. Once again I'm using the, the K-beater. And I'm um, just using that to uh, beat 60% of the heat out. So before I start adding the eggs, uh, I need to release the heat from the, from the panay. So which, uh, if I start adding them now, there's a good chance I could scramble the eggs because uh, there's such, such an intense heat in the bowl. So we just mix it on a medium to low speed just to release that heat. And then once we release about 60% of the heat, we'll just sort of start to slowly add the eggs. Got the mixture in the bowl, it's still, uh, still bedding around and usually takes about a minute or two to release that heat. Sometimes even more, just depends. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Usually this, uh, this plastic guard is great for protecting your mix from the, you know, like the splashing flour or splashing liquids. But in this case, um, I want to release the heat. So this guard will sort of trap the heat in. Uh, so I just take it off for this process to let the heat release a lot quicker. So what I do now is I just put my hands in the bottom of the bowl. You should do that as well when you first put the mix in, just to judge the heat. Um, so you, you can tell when you, you've lost 60% of the heat. So I can feel it now, it's slightly warm. So I'm just going to start to add my eggs really slowly. So a good thing to do as well is beat the eggs, that way you get an even mixture throughout the mix when you add them. So just pour in about one egg at a time, roughly. So if I threw it all in at once, it's a bit uncertain to what the mixture's sort of texture will be. You may not have to add it all the eggs, because once the mixture gets too runny, you can't fix it. Now it's just starting to come together, coming off the side of the bowl. So to tell when the mix is ready is that the mixture should have a nice shine to it. 
uh, like a glossy effect. It should be quite, uh, still quite thick. When I lift the mixer up, it should just fall off the beater. So it shouldn't be stuck around the beater. Uh, it shouldn't run off like liquid. It should just slide off. So you can see it's nice and glossy. Still got, um, still stable, but not too thick. So what I've got here, I've got, uh, I've got a baking sheet, uh, which I'm going to pipe my shoe onto. So you can grease it with butter. Some people like to do that. Uh, the reason I don't grease it is because when you pipe it, uh, it sticks to the tray better. Uh, so when I, when I bring it out of the oven, I run a scraper under it and just take them straight off. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe on the tray. So I've just got a piping bag with a piping tube inside it. And we're just going to put some of the shoe pastry in there. Don't put too much in there if you're not good at piping or you have no experience. It just makes it harder for yourself to pipe. So just nicely, just clean the bag down. Take away any of the air. Just twist it nicely so you create pressure in the bag. Makes it easier for yourself to pipe. So automatically that little twisted bit will just come apart. And we'll just pipe a little bit in there just to make sure there's no air bubbles. If you're not confident uh, with piping and uh, you, sort of like your sizes, an another trick you can do is if you get flour, and something like the size you want to pipe and you can just make little marks on the tray so it makes it easier for yourself to pipe the exact uh, shape you want. So today we're going to pipe two sizes so first I'm going to do the bigger ones so make sure you keep a nice pressure in the bag so I'm just going to pipe them about that size and make sure you keep them evenly spaced the shoe pastry will expand in the oven it'll blow up quite big so don't have them too close together That's the larger ones, first tray. So for the second tray, you just do a half the size. And when you pipe, I think a lot of people think, you know, when something's round, that they have to move the bag around. But if you watch what I do, I don't move the bag at all. Just keep it in one place. And then I just flick off the end, that's it. A lot of people try and draw it, um, but you don't need to when you pipe. It's just keep the bag in one place, apply pressure. You shouldn't need to apply much pressure if you keep twisting and keep the pressure in the bag. So that's our shoe pastry piped. So what we need to do now is roll out the sablé that we made earlier. Um, and we're going to just cut little discs and put it on top. So that'll give us a nice um, sort of short bready texture and, and like a crunchy texture on the outside of the profiterole. Uh, so now I'm going to grab the sab layout, which we made earlier. So as you can see, it's gotten quite hard pretty quick because it's very thin. So we just want to roll it out to about three or four millimetres thick. Don't want it too thick, otherwise it'll smother the shoe pastry and it won't let it rise properly. Okay, so I've just I've rolled that out to the thickness I want using uh, something of the same size to cut it out. So you just want to cut discs of the sablé. So just place it on the top, like so. I mean, because you're not working with a lot of pastry, make sure that you, you cut quite close to each other. You're going to have to keep the scrap and probably re-roll it for the smaller ones. One of the keys is the reason why I put it in the freezer as well is that you've got to keep the, the dough quite cold when you cut it, otherwise it's very hard to handle and it will just sort of fall apart on you. So to get a nice cut, make sure it's cold. Uh, now I'm just going to re-roll it. What I'll do is I'll pop these large ones in the oven and I'll re-roll this for the small ones. So the large ones are all finished. So I've got all the sablé on top. Got the oven set at 250. So I've re-rolled the scrap from cutting out the large ones and now I'm just going to cut out the small ones for, to match the small shoe. But what I've done also with the, the shoe pastry is I've, I've preheated my oven to 250 degrees or usually whatever the highest temperature your oven will go. Now switch the oven off. That residual heat that's in there is going to do the first part of cooking to the shoe. And what, why I do that is because it's a more of an even cook. So I get, instead of having the fan blowing and the heat pumping in there and the shoes yeah, it rises, but it rises uncontrollably. So you can't really control that first part which, where it sort of opens up. So to get a nicer, more even shoe, I switch the oven off and let the residual heat at the highest temperature cook, cook it for the first stage. We will turn the oven back on and we'll have it on a low temperature 
and, uh, and we'll cook it through to dry it out. But that's uh, just the reasoning behind that first cooking stage. So what I'm going to do now is just go back to putting the small discs of sablé on my small shoe. So the shoe pastry itself, this, this dough, has quite a water content in it. As you see from the start of it, it's a lot of water and milk. Milk's mainly water. How it works, once you thicken it up with the flour, the flour becomes the stability of the, of the dough. So it gives it that thickening agent. It brings it together, keeps it stable, gives it the strength. But when it goes in the oven, what starts to happen is with the high temperature, the water starts to evaporate. So the moisture starts pushing. So where does the moisture go? It's coming from the, the center of this, this pastry. So it starts to push up, creating like a, like creating steam. So the inside of this pastry becomes a pocket as the outside gets a crust from the heat. And it starts to rise and rise. Okay, so now I've put the sablé on, uh, on my small shoe. I'm just gonna set these aside because we're gonna cook these separately. Because these are smaller, they'll cook a lot quicker. So we don't, we don't want to put them in the oven with the larger ones because we'll have to take these out earlier. And if they're not ready in time, you, you take the risk of sort of making the larger ones collapse. If I have to open the oven and let out all that heat and, and the, the shoe pastry could collapse. So it's, until the shoe pastry is stable enough, you can't really open the oven door. So, and that, that is when it's got a bit of color. So the state, when you know the shoe pastry stables, when it's got a little bit of color, nicely lightly golden brown and that's where it's at the stage where you need to start drying it out. So I'm just going to set these aside until the big ones come out and we'll bake them later. While the shoe pastry is in the oven cooking away, I'm just going to start on our fillings. So what we've got is uh, we're going to do a maple custard and we're going to do a lemon curd. So for the maple custard, um, I've got the milk, uh, the vanilla bean and some lemon zest in there and I'm just going to, I'll turn that onto low and just let that infuse. So I'm just going to put the pot with the milk in it on two or three just to bring it up slowly, get a slow infusion. While I'm multitasking, I've got the lemon curd on the other side. You know, I can just let that come up slowly, get that flavour through the milk the, the, with the vanilla bean and the lemon zest. It's a great benefit of using the induction. You know, I've got com complete control. I don't have to worry. Walk, I can walk away and I know that it's only coming up slowly. It's not going to overboil. It's not going to go everywhere. So, you know, I feel pretty safe. While I'm sitting there, I'm going to start on my lemon curd, which is just over here, which I've just got the lemon juice and I've got my eggs in there, lemon juice and eggs. So I'm just going to mix those two together. Put that on about six on the induction. So I'll move this a little bit quicker because I'm going to pay all the attention to this one while that's slowly infusing. So just give it a good stir, make sure the eggs are broken down with the uh, lemon juice. And we just want to heat this up to roughly about 60 degrees. Uh, the reason why we heat it to 60 is just so when I add the sugar and the corn flour, uh, the sugar dissolves straight away uh, and the corn flour sort of breaks down a lot easier. Rather than putting it in cold, you've got a lot of chance of adding the, the corn flour starts to coagulate a little bit. So we're now, you can see we're coming up to 60 degrees. Just add in the corn flour and sugar. We're gonna cook this out till it comes to the boil. Bringing this to the boil, A, we pasteurize the eggs at 85. And then to activate the corn flour, we need to bring it to the boil so it starts to thicken. Um, so just continuously stir it, just to keep it mixing, keep the mixture moving and uh, just to avoid, you know, scrambling it or anything if you, if you uh, forget about it, because I've, I've got it on a little bit higher. So it's just coming to the boil now. You see the bubbles start to appear. So they cook out for about 20, 30 seconds. Pour that into a bowl. And we're just going to leave this to cool to 50 degrees. So the reason why I let it cool to 50 degrees is because we're going to add the butter that you see at the front there. So we're going to add this butter to it at 50. And the reason why we added it at 50 is as butter's made up of, uh, of water and milk solids, we don't want to separate that. So it's very fragile. Um, so to keep, to keep the nice creamy texture you have naturally in butter, uh, we want to fold that through at 50 degrees. So we keep that really, retain that really nice creaminess in the curd. Uh, rather than, if I threw it in now, what would happen is the butter would split. Yes, it'd mix through, but you'd have more of a grainy, a lot more gelatinous texture. You don't have that nice creamy, buttery taste. So that's why I lower the temperature because 50 degrees is just warm enough just to break it through the curd, but it'll drop the temperature very quickly and it'll retain the structure. So just pop a thermometer in. Now that's sort of to the side and I'm waiting for that to cool. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go back to my maple custard. As you can see, it's starting to warm up a bit naturally anyway from the low temperature. I'm just gonna put it up a little bit, take it up to six, bring it to the boil, cause now I'm ready to give it my attention. Okay, so now for the maple custard, what I've got here is my egg yolks and maple syrup, and I've got corn flour. So I'm gonna add the corn flour to the egg yolks and maple. 
I'm just going to whisk this till it's pale. I just want to create some air in the mix. I'm also dispersing the corn flour in here rather than throwing it straight in the milk where it would probably go lumpy. Adding air to the eggs and sugar will give me a thicker custard. This mixture is cold, that mixture is hot. I don't want to throw that straight in there because what's going to happen is it's going to scramble. So I'm going to add a little bit of this into the egg yolk and maple mixture and just bring that to temperature. So this helps us just to, when we add it back, it's at the similar temperature so we, we avoid scrambling the eggs. So now I add this mixture back. I'm going to turn up the induction back up to about six and then continue stirring this until it comes to the boil. So now you can see, you know, the custard has come to the boil. It's nice and shiny, you know, it's nice and glossy. I'm going to do the same thing as I did for the lemon curd. So I'm going to add butter to it, not as much. Everything I add butter to, and that's, a, that's sort of a creamy texture, I always 50 degrees. 50, 40, sometimes 35, just depends on how creamy or what kind of texture you want. So this is at 50. Okay, so now that lemon curd's ready at 50 degrees, I'm just going to add the butter. So just put all the butter in at once. Just give it a quick whisk through. Just break it up a little bit. And now I'm just going to use the, using the stick blender. So we're just going to emulsify the curd and the butter. So this mixer is really good for this because it's handheld. You can just put it in your bowl or in a jug or whatever you need and you, because of the blade spinning so fast, it brings fats and, and waters together and emulsifies the product a lot better than you could with using a whisk. So it's a lot handier, you get a lot smoother creams, a lot better on the palate. And also, especially with this, you, you need to mix it for about a minute with, uh, with this to emulsify it, a bit like a mayonnaise, so you get that sort of aeration throughout it. So you can see how the colours change. As I blitz it, you know, it gets more air in the fats inside the mixture. And you can see, I mean, it's sort of, you can see it's starting to set like, like a lot wobblier. It gets a lot more pale colour. So we've got a nice, glossy lemon curd there. So the beauty, another beauty of the stick mixer is just how easy it is to clean. Clip it off, wash the tip, it's, it's quite handy. So now just scrape down the sides. I'm just going to touch the surface with the cling film so we avoid getting a skin. If I don't put cling film on the surface, the air will just create like a, a thick leathery skin on the surface and then if we try and remix that it'll become like lumps throughout our mixture. The reason for cling film on there as well is if the mixture is still warm and you put it in the fridge, if there's air in between the mixture and the, and the cling film, it'll create condensation. So I'm just going to set that aside and we're going to move back to the maple custard. So once again we want to get this to 50 degrees. So now we're just going to tip the custard into the bowl, uh, to take it out of the saucepan because uh, the saucepan will retain a lot more heat than the bowl because the bowl's colder uh, and the saucepan has just been on the, on the induction. As I said earlier, we want to get this to 50 degrees so we can fold our butter through. And for the exact same reason as the lemon curd, we want to keep that nice structure of the butter throughout the custard. So I've got my uh, maple custard here in the bowl. It's just reached 50 degrees. Um, so now I'm just going to add the butter into the mix. I'm just going to stir that through roughly with a whisk. And then I'm just going to finish it off with the stick blender. So once your custard's nice and smooth, give the bowl a scrape down, so make sure if there's any bits of butter stuck to the sides or any unmixed custard, now's the time to mix it through. Same as the lemon curd, we're going to cover it in cling film. So what I'm going to do now is just some caramelised almonds on the induction stove. Uh, so what I've got for that is just some simple syrup, so some sugar syrup, which is just half sugar, half water, uh, equal amounts. Uh, and I'm just going to start by putting some of that into the saucepan. And I'm just going to bring that to the boil. So I'm just going to let this reduce slightly. So I want it to get a little bit thicker. So when I throw the nuts in, that the sugar sort of coats the outside of the nuts. So I'm just going to throw the, the nuts in now when it gets a little bit thicker. So the nuts I'm using here are just almonds. Uh, and they're just blanched almonds. So no, no skin. And I've just, I've just roasted them lightly in the oven. So just take it off the heat for two seconds. Just want to recrystallize the sugar. So recrystallizing your sugar the sugar will start to go back to sandy and should coat around the outside of each nut. It just avoids them sticking a lot more at the end and gives them a more even coat on each nut. So you just got to keep stirring it until you activate the recrystallization, as you can see now. 
see how it's getting sandy again. So just keep stirring. And then I'll put it back on the heat now. And we're gonna just bring that back to caramel. So I've just turned the temperature down to two, just so I can walk away for a second on the induction. Uh, and it's quite controlled, so I know it's not gonna burn the caramel. Uh, and I'm just gonna set up some baking paper, just so when it's ready, I'll pour it out. But as you can see, like doing this method, see I have no excess caramel. All I have is what's around the nuts. That way you don't get those big hard bits of sugar. So now I've caramelised them where I want them to be. Just gonna tip them out. We now have our shoe all baked and we have all our fillings made. So now I'm gonna make the chocolate decoration for the shoe pastry. Um, I've just got a saucepan on, uh, on number one on the induction, so it's very low. And I'm just gonna melt it uh, on the direct heat. That's one of the beauties of the induction. It's quite gentle and very controlled, so you, you're able to melt chocolate directly on the heat. So when you melt the chocolate on the induction, you just wanna keep it on low. You don't wanna put it too high, otherwise it'll burn. Just on a nice low heat, you can see it's just gently melting away. So you can see I've got a nice chocolate. So now I'm just gonna take it out of the out of this saucepan and put it into a bowl, because I need to temper it. So we're using couverture chocolate. Uh, so you need to crystallize it to make it set. So the chocolate that's in the pan should be at around 45 degrees. And the tempering method I'm gonna to use today is a seeded method. So the seeded method just means that I'm throwing cold chocolate back into hot chocolate to seed it, to, to, to bring the temperature down to start the crystallization process. So roughly, you wanna throw a nice handful in and you want, to, you want to bring that temperature down as quick as possible. So just stir through those cold, cold, cold buds of chocolate. If you're using a block, you just chop it up. So a good way to check the chocolate temperature, usually for tempering is 45 at the melt, throw in the cold chocolate, you need to drop it to around 26 degrees, and then you need to bring it back up to about 28 for white chocolate. So a good way I always, I always do to tell is just touch it with your finger. It feels cold to me, so I know it's I know it's at least 26. So now my chocolate's clear again. So a good way of, of testing if it's tempered is just to, on the tip of a spatula, just sit a bit of chocolate and let it, just let it set. That way you know that it will set. So the biggest problem, if it's not tempered, it won't set. So now I'm gonna um, add some yellow lip soluble color. So lip soluble color means it's fat soluble. It's a coloring that you need for chocolate. Uh, so you use water-based colour, the, the chocolate will seize water's chocolate's worst enemy. So you need to use this a powdered colour. And I'm just going to buzz it in. So just buzz the colour in until you get rid of all the, the little lumps of colour. So we've got a nice yellow colour now. So now for the chocolate decoration squares. I've got a piece of uh, plastic here, like acetate plastic, and I'm just going to pour some of this uh, coloured white chocolate on there, which has been tempered. So now we've got the chocolate uh, on the acetate, just spread it out, just get a nice thin sheet. So the reason why we use this plastic is because it gives off a natural shine. So when the cocoa butter crystallises, if you leave it for 24 hours, you'll get a really nice sheen. So we'll leave that there for the moment, just until it starts to set. Once it starts to set, we have to we need to cut it into the squares. So what we'll do is we'll move on to start filling the profiteroles. So just uh, just grab six six of each, so one to match the other one. I just set them out nicely on a tray. In the top of the large one, I'm just going to cut a little hole, and this is where we'll fill it from. I'm just using a paring knife, and uh, I'm just cutting out just like a sort of jagged motion. And in the smaller ones, we're just going to make a hole in the bottom. So now we're going to fill the profiteroles. So first thing to do is, is to fill our piping bags. So I've got the lemon curd filling we made earlier. So next we're going to fill up the maple custard. So just into a piping bag. So first into the, into the bottom we're going to pipe the maple custard. So just put the tube inside and just uh, pipe, put some pressure in. Fill it up about three quarters, leave some room for the lemon curd. And then same for the small ones, just pipe, it's about halfway. 
good way to tell, uh, you know, when you're feeling profiteroles always is to buy the weight. So you should always like sort of feel them by weight. And if they're quite heavy, it usually means there's a good amount of custard inside. Because there's nothing worse than uh, getting a profiterole and it's half empty with no custard inside. So next we're going to put the lemon curd in. So just uh, snip the top of the bag and just straight, straight in the middle. Just fill the rest of it up with the lemon curd. And same for the small one, just a little, just a little squirt inside. So once they're, they're full, you just want to clean them, clean them off on the side of a bowl so they're nice and uh, flat, nothing sticking out. It's important to smooth it off because we're going to stack them on top of each other. So if we didn't, they'd just sort of split out the sides and look quite messy. So we need to really make sure you clean it off because um, we're going to dip it in icing in a minute as well. So if that was bulging over the top, the icing would sort of separate from the icing and create, it wouldn't look as, as nice and neat. Now I'm just, uh, I'm gonna cut the chocolate into the squares I need. So I need to cut them into about three and a half, four centimeters by four centimeters roughly. So just using a ruler or something that's, that's flat. So once you cut the squares, we're just gonna put a sheet of baking paper over the top and flip it upside down. As the chocolate sets and crystallizes, it'll retract. So just stop that, flip it over so the weight goes back on its other side. So you just turn it over like that. And the more you do, you can then stack a weight on top as well, just to keep it more safe from, from bending the opposite way. So I'm just gonna pop that into the fridge. Now we're gonna ice, ice the profiteroles. So I've just got some fondant here, which is just a pre-made product. It's just made with a sugar syrup that's been manipulated on the bench. And it turns like a white, creamy sort of pasty uh, texture. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna heat this up to 40 degrees, and then uh, I'm gonna color it yellow. And this will form the icing that will will go on the top of the profiteroles. So you just, it's quite tough stuff, so you just keep keep working at it and slowly it'll uh, start melting. Keep stirring that down till it gets to around 40 degrees. Just adding some yellow color. And just stir it through and then, until you get the right yellow that you're looking for. So I'm measuring the temperature just to make sure it's 40 degrees. Uh, if it's too hot, you can get a dull sheen. Um, so you overheat it. The, the, the shine on the fondant, it's not as glossy. And if it's too cold, a lot of the time that's very hard to dip the profiterole in, it kind of gets stuck. Um, so you kind of got to get the temperature right, otherwise it's really hard to work with. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of sugar syrup because it's just attached to, to uh, thick. So with the profiterole, I'll start with the small ones because usually they're easier. Just want to dip it in. You don't want too much fondant on the top, otherwise it'll drip down. Uh, so you need to keep it quite even. So before I do the big ones, I'm just going to shove a couple of um, almonds inside them. So the almonds I'm putting in there for a little bit of texture. Exactly the same technique. Uh, it's a little bit can be a little bit trickier because they're larger. Uh, just placing the chocolate square on the top. So after you place the chocolate square on the top, we're just gonna place a small profiterole. I'm just using a little bit of curd just to make sure it sticks. So now, just to finish it off, I'm just going to put uh, caramelised almond on the top. This is our final product. This is our lemon and maple religious. For more great recipes like this, check out our other videos. Or ask the friendly staff at Harvey Norman how to colour your world. <laughs>